What's up, Breakthrough Success listeners? Mark Bird, the podcast and virtual summit launch coach here. And one of the things we have to think about at the turn of every year is how are we going to have a super successful year, a year of no nonsense? Well, our guest has writing a book around this idea, year of no nonsense. And in addition to that, she is an author, podcaster, speaker, four-time Ironman triathlete and coach. And something really inspiring is that after she completed her first Ironman, she set out to show women and men that they could do anything in the body they have right now. Her new book, The Year of No Nonsense, teaches readers how to get over themselves and on with their lives. Our guest who joins us for this episode of Breakthrough Success is none other than Meredith Atwood. Meredith, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. How are you, Mark? I am doing great. Thank you again, Meredith, for taking the time to join us. And I mean, to have the like run your first Ironman and then turn this into I want to inspire people. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of where that came from and uh, how you've been able to inspire others so far. Sure. So I was um, an Olympic weightlifter in high school, but I was not an endurance athlete. So I did not run. I did not swim. I did not bike. And when I graduated from college, I ended up going to law school and becoming an attorney and having two kids and getting getting married and everything. I gained a ton of weight and drank a ton of wine. And I just was not living any version of my best life. And I came across the sport of triathlon by complete accident. And I did my first triathlon weighing like 230 pounds. I just did it in the body I had. And I was hooked. I was hooked because it felt like something that was so impossible to do, especially as I was, but it just changed me. And so I started, started blogging about it and then ended up going and writing um, a book about how to do triathlon for a busy mom, (laughs) a busy woman, someone who isn't very fit or needs to lose weight. And so that was my first book in 2011, Triathlon for the Every Woman. And it's in its second edition now. It just came out in March, which is cool. But I, I went on to do long ones. I did Ironman, which is the um, long, you know, long triathlons, 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike and a 26.2 mile marathon. And so I did four of those. And and along the way, I just wrote about it on my blog and social media. And it kind of grew from there. I mean, this was, I started this in 2010, which is, was the time to really start blogging (laughs) back before Facebook had a crazy algorithm. And, you you know, the people that liked your page saw your stuff. And so it it just kind of grew from there. And, um, it's, I've been really fortunate to be able to leave the practice of law. I left, um, being a lawyer about two years ago and, um, to pursue this career as a, as a writer and a speaker. So I'm, I'm very, very fortunate in that regard. And one of the things interesting about your story is that you did the, you did your first Ironman where like uh, you just want to see how you would do it as you are. And I feel like there are a lot of people who, whether it's a race or some kind of a physical event, they don't want to do it because they don't feel like they are ready. And I think part of having a successful year is you don't have to feel completely ready. You just have to start. So I'm wondering what got you to start and then um, – be able to complete your first Ironman? Yeah, yeah. So I knew that I didn't like where I was. And I knew somehow deep down that if I waited, that I would never get going. Because I always had this goal that I wanted to be a certain weight. When I get to a certain weight, then I'll be able to run. When I get to a certain weight, then I'll be able to wear a bathing suit. And I realized that if I would just go and try to do whatever I wanted to do, as I am, you know, it might be slower. I might fall down, (laughs) but it doesn't really matter what size you are. You're still going to fall down sometimes. And so I just had this sense that if I waited, I would lose courage. And if I waited, I would lose momentum. And so I've kind of out of that, I developed my um, mantra, like my trademark is just keep moving forward, which is just what it means, you know, one foot in front of the other, always looking to, to better yourself, but to keep moving forward, but start where you are. 
And the funny thing is I always had this, this weight in my head. I was like, if I weighed 180 pounds, because <laughs> I'm a big girl, he's three weight lifter, I'm 5'8". Um, 180 is like fine for me. And it's so funny because I, I did these four Ironmans and now I do some CrossFit and weightlifting and I'm, I'm decently fit, um, but I'm still not 180 pounds. <laughs> I'm like 184. And so it's just funny when I look back on the last 10 years, if I had waited until I got to that erroneous 180 pound number, none of what has happened would have happened. I'd still be waiting, even though I'm the fittest I've ever been right now. Um, so yeah, you just, you got to start exactly where you are because there's, there's only progress to be had. And Meredith, uh, really strikes out an important idea where, uh, she felt like, you know, she had to be a certain weight number. And sometimes you, uh, you can feel like you have to have a certain status or achieve a certain thing before you can move on, before you can do what you actually want to do. But I think this comes to the idea of, uh, being flexible with uh, the approach. So uh, you may not feel like you are ready right now. You may feel like you want to have a certain status first, but there's only one way to really uh, get to where you want to go, and that is putting in the work. That is going out there before you truly feel like you are ready. And I think that's part of the reason why people don't have a successful new year. I think a lot of people, they may think that, you know, I'm not ready or they have a single setback and then they're done. So yeah. how can we go into a new year and actually go after or have this year of no nonsense as Meredith likes to call it? I think you have to just have the right mindset. Like you said, um, if you wait until you're ready, you just got to go with what you have right now. Like when I went, when I wrote my first book, I pitched it to a few publishers and it was a no go. And so I self published it. And then this neck, the second edition was picked up by a traditional publisher. Cause I really spent the time and the money and the energy making that first self published book, like a really good quality book. I had an editor. It was, you know, it, it definitely improved exponentially when I had the new version come out, but I really worked hard to make sure it was the best I could do. And I think when you're looking at a new year, you have to just ask yourself the question, like, how can I just do the best with what I have, the resources I have? How can I work hard and really take every day and make sure I'm squeezing out all of my potential? Because at the end of the day, it's about you. It's up to you. No one's going to do it for you. I have, <laughs> I have a saying in the book, no one is coming for you because they don't know you're missing. <laughs> like no one is going to come save you. You have to save yourself from whatever it is, whether it's your own nonsense or getting out of your job, getting out of a bad relationship. You have to take charge of your life. And so everyone likes New Year's because it's a chance to, to flip over, you know, turn a new leaf and start fresh. But the idea with the year of no nonsense is you can have your year. You can start it whenever. You can start it right now, exactly right now, and you can change your life. And it doesn't have to be fitness. It can be anything. But we do know, I mean, there's enough research out there that tells us you've got to have good personal health, whatever your definition of health is. You've got to feel good if you're going to do good. And so I think starting with your health is always a great place if you, if you just don't know where to start. I mean, health is definitely a really key area. It's going to positively affect your productivity and make anything else that you want to do much easier for you to achieve. And a key point, Meredith, as I'm mentioning, is like, you know, you have to take control of your life. Uh, it's not like someone else finds you. It's not like someone else leads you to the promised land. You get there. You could know people who help you along the journey, but like we're, we'll use running in this example. Like you could have people who help you, give you words of encouragement, tell you different ways to run fast. But at the end of the day, you are the person who has to actually run. So right. I think we get better at taking control of our lives instead of looking at like outside factors and being quick to make excuses and shift responsibility away from us if things don't work out. 
Right. So what we have to do in order to take charge of our life is see the truth about ourselves. We have so many of us are, are spending time blaming other people and sometimes rightly so. Sometimes other people are a cause of our problems. However, we have to see the truth about ourselves. And I think in this current culture, which is all about like self-love and accept yourself as you are, which is not a bad thing, but I think it comes with a caveat. If you're not happy as you are, where you are, um, in the position you are, you have to see the truth about where you are. And if you're not happy with your weight, your fitness, your job, your relationship, look at the truth about it to you. Like what is true about the situation? And then once you see the truth, you have a choice to make. Do I stay? <laughs> Do I go? Do I leave it? Accept it? What, whatever. I mean, you, you then, the ball's in your court. And sometimes we say, oh, but we don't have a, I don't have a choice. There's always a choice. It may be the choice between two really not so great things, <laughs> but you always have a choice. And when you, when you see the truth about your life, you can then choose. You can choose what to work on. You can choose where to go. You can choose to stay or go or quit your job or get a new job or start a side hustle. All of these things become your choice. And then at that point, you can decide, um, do I want to spend my energy and time doing this thing? Do I want to spend my time creating this new business? There's a lot of options, but until you open your eyes and start where you are, you're never going to be able to get anywhere. And Meredith brings up a really great point where we are making the choices. If you want to, uh, binge on video streaming, that's your choice. If you want to spend the extra hour to grow a podcast, to be uh, interviewing people, to be making that kind of impact, that is also your choice. And I'm not saying that you have to be perfect every single time, but it is good to make more often make these kinds of choices that are going to help you towards your goals and allow you to become a better, healthier person. So I think part of the issue is that people may know what the right choice is, but they may not necessarily make it because the right choice could be hard, it could be difficult, it could involve a lot more work than just sitting on the couch. So I'm wondering if you could share with us, how can we get better at making the choice that we know is right? Well, and I think sometimes maybe we, I, I guess that's a good question, because I think you have to just stop relying on external factors, and you have to quit thinking that motivation is something that you just intrinsically have or something that's going to just get dropped off like a stork dropping off a baby. <laughs> um, no one is going to bring the motivation to your doorstep. And that's also, it's also true. So when you, when you're faced with a choice that you need to make, I mean, you really have to get to the point where the pain of staying the same is, is worse, you know, than the pain of changing and change is hard. And, that's okay. I think there's this taboo that things are supposed to be easy, but I don't know about you, Mark. When I came into this world, I was not promised that anything would be easy. <laughs> <laughs> like there was no, they, there's no contract we signed that said life is easy. And yes, we don't want to run toward pain, but there is a certain power in accepting discomfort and learning to be uncomfortable and and not always seeking the easy thing because when you do the hard things, you have a lot to be proud of. You know, you, you can step back and be like, man, I did that hard thing. And, and that's how I got, you know, that's how triathlon became so addicting for me because um, I wasn't a natural tr triathlete. I wasn't a natural swimmer, biker, biker, runner. And so it was amazing <laughs> to me when I crossed the finish line, I was like, this was hard it's amazing I did it and I want to do it again. And when you take on physical challenges, I think it bleeds into all the other areas of your life too. And you think, man, you know, if I just went and ran that marathon, I can certainly start a podcast. <laughs> like it, it, it sort of, um, it, it just takes over your mental state. You have to start with your mind though, like truly. So if you're constantly saying, oh my gosh, this is hard. I don't know. This is hard. This seems hard. Then it's going to feel hard. You have to tell yourself, this is fine and I'm going to go for it. 
<laughs> like truly that's, that's the best way to, to do it. And, um, you know, our body and our, and our hearts follow what's going on in our head. And if we're, we're having this talk that everything is hopeless and, and we're never going to get anywhere, then yeah, that's true. <laughs> And I'm happy Meredith brought something up where she said, like, you know, like doing a triathlon or doing a marathon, it's like, oh, I can start a podcast now. Like, that, <laughs> that helps you. Um, not just, like, you could say, like, you know, that's an hour of fitness a day or whatever it is. Uh, but, and that's like, that's an hour I'm not working on my business. But doing the fitness really helps you be more active, be more energetic during those times you are working on your business. I've definitely seen it on my end because I'm a runner. And one mm -hmm. thing that I do want to talk about, like, because for a new year, everyone's like thinking of their best version of themselves. Everyone's thinking these like super big new year's resolutions. And, uh, there is a line between like an over exaggerated goal that could feel like really far out there versus a challenging goal like you mentioned earlier you want to get out of the comfort zone but some people they make their goals unreasonable to the point where they don't mm -hmm. accomplish the goal and then they feel bad so what's your advice on finding that line between challenging and unrealistic so I like to look at goals and I, I talk about this in my triathlon book, actually, when you're trying to pick a distance of a race, but you can apply it to anything. I talk about having tiers of goals, um, T I E R S not tears, like boohoo crying, um, where you pick a short, quick, I call them quick goals, like something that you can accomplish really quick, like in a month, like, okay, I want to get a website and get some headshots taken. Um, because you want to, you want to have a podcast. Let's say you want to have a podcast. Um, so you set a quick goal. I, I can get this website and get my domain. I can get some photos taken. Right. And then you set a little bit bigger goal, which in three to, in two to three months, I want to have my equipment. I want to have watched everything on YouTube. <laughs> I want to, you know, have prepared for it. And then like your big goal is like six months to a year. And then um, and it can be whatever time frame, but just for the podcast example. And then in six months, like in May, start of June, you're ready to do your podcast. And but what you have done is you've laid groundwork. You you've not just said, okay, January first, I'm starting a podcast. And you go out and buy a microphone and you buy headphones and you have no you know host to host your podcast and you don't have a website and all of a sudden everything feels too big. And, and then you're like, well, I just can't do a podcast. It's too hard. And so that is the kind of thing you have to look at your big goal and set it out there, you know, a certain distance that's realistic. And so if you want to be a top podcast on iTunes, set that for two years and lay the foundation for what it's going to take to get there. Um, and, you know, if you get there earlier, super, <laughs> super, <laughs> super. Um, but that, yeah, we, we say that all the time. Like, you know, I want to have a bikini body by the summer. I mean, that's totally possible, but it depends where you, where you're starting from. And so, and I, I think a lot of times if we've had a, a life where we've constantly not met our goals, we then set these goals that are so extreme, almost like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, to affirm the fact that we don't have any self-confidence, like that we don't think we're po it's possible to succeed. So if you, you set this goal so big and so soon that it's virtually impossible to tackle, then it becomes a, an excuse for even trying. And so setting goals is very, very important. And the way you do it is, is very critical. And Meredith brings up a really great point where like you want to be realistic with the timing. Like you don't want to say uh, like having the beach bikini body um, when, you know, like it'll be a reach. Now, again, I don't know who like, you know, like people have different uh, backgrounds, context, things like that. Uh, but sometimes you give yourself a goal like, you know, like you would want to have this, but it takes a lot of work to get there. And that's where we can have this instant gratification problem where we set a goal, just thinking about the end result, but not thinking about how much work it has to take to get there. Uh, the amount of hours it takes to get there. 
And I mean, also when it comes to like setting micro steps along the way, like for the podcast example, being best in iTunes in two years, like those smaller things, like uh, learning how to host a podcast, learning how to like get the hosting for your podcast and learning how to generate mm -hmm. revenue with your podcast. There's so many little steps that go into this whole process of goal setting and then being realistic with the time frame where maybe you set it a little further in advance, but you actually get it done because you're real with yourself. Right. But I also like the, um, the concept of manifesting and really um, keeping that big finish line in mind, because I think that that's, you know, very positive to have that, to, to write those affirmations, you know, I'm, I'm going to be, or I am a top hundred podcast on iTunes, like write those affirmations, see them as if they're true. Um, but then work your tail off to make them true. And I think that's where sometimes the disconnect is too. You know, you don't want to just say, Oh, this is, this goal is so big. I'll never get there. Like that's right. That's self-defeating. But it, so there's like many layers to, I think, breaking through the success, like many, many layers. And if you fall down at any stage of it, it, it really is a hindrance to the, the big goal. And I mean, it is good to write these big goals down because it gives you this idea of what's possible, this grand vision. And Meredith mentioned earlier, like, you know, have a plan. Like, don't just like write the goal down and end there. Like, write down how are you going to get there? What steps are you going to take? And when it comes to like a bigger goal, like a two-year goal, for instance, uh, that's going to be something where you're going to have to write that plan multiple times. Uh, no one really writes a flawless, perfect plan for a long-term thing. It's this is the plan. This is how I'm going to get there. But you make adjustments along the way. And then by making those adjustments, uh, you actually develop a complete plan through a lot of revisions that gets you to where you want to go. Right, right. And I know your book, Year of No Nonsense, uh, is available. So we'll definitely be linking to that in the show notes for everyone who wants to get their copy. I definitely recommend it. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, I mean, definitely go get your no nonsense because that book is just an expansion of what we've covered. But I'm wondering Meredith, if you could share with us where we can uh, continue following your work and journey. Yeah, absolutely. So I am everywhere as swim bike mom. So when you think of that, think of triathlon, which is swim bike run, but just insert mom instead of run. Um, so swim bike mom on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and then on LinkedIn, I'm Meredith Atwood. And then the website is swimbikemom.com. And you can pick the book up anywhere you buy your books because it's a traditionally published book. So it has distribution nationwide and it's uh, independent bookstores, Amazon, and it will be in stores and Target and Walmart in the new year. So very exciting about the book. Yeah. Meredith, I'm excited for your book as well, because that is the author's dream to get into all those different bookstores. Yeah, it really is. It's very exciting. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So again, congrats on the book. It's definitely really exciting. Definitely make sure you go grab your copy of the book if you enjoy this episode. But Meredith, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Breakthrough Success. It was such a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it.